talk about the, the first thing, uh, okay, sorry. What we're gonna do tonight is look at systems that allow us to classify sentiment that are unsupervised problems. Okay? And then what we'll do on Saturday is talk about supervised sentiment problems. So we're gonna, we're gonna do a little bit more machine learning kinds of tasks with sentiment, because classification, sentiment's just a special type of classification, right? Uh, but I wanna start with systems that allow you to classify sentiment where you don't have to have the answer, okay? which is really useful because if you don't have time to train your own model or you wanna apply a model to data that <clears throat> is unusual, you could start with these unsupervised systems. You'll see that they don't tech, always work the best, but they're a good start. Okay. All right. So sentiment is one of the most widely used applications for machine learning and classification techniques okay, if we don't consider part of speech tagging. Okay. So part of speech tagging is definitely one of the biggest like NLP tasks. That's why we started there, but sentiment like is a lot of people are interested in it. I mean, for very obvious reasons. It's it's good that we have systems that allow us to read the room, so to speak, and um, classify <clears throat> these types of text into these bins. Right? Uh, for business purposes, these seem also seem very obvious, right? We want to know what people think about us. We want to know how to classify our support tickets. We want to eliminate hate speech off of our site. Although if you kind of look at the current trends for social media sites, it kind of depends, right? They all treat this a little bit differently. Okay. So sometimes people call this opinion mining. Um, I, I, I think that's just, you know, that's what you're grabbing. A sentiment is an opinion. Um, opinion mining might also capture some other types of critiques, but in general, when people use opinion mining, they're talking about sentiment. And then there's just so much opinion. People love to give their opinions, right? <laughs> That's what the internet is for. It's an opinion shouting box. So there are reviews of everything. Reviews of movies, which is one of the most popular data sets. There's Yelp reviews, Amazon reviews, uh, reviews, 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 so many reviews. These are easy data sets to find. Um, I mean, shoot, blog posts are essentially reviews of various things. I gave my, uh, I was in a meeting earlier where I gave my review of how I felt about Tidyverse. <laughs> so, like, reviews happen a lot. Okay. Uh, social media data. Uh, so we can think about posts as, as things to use for, um, for classifying sentiment. Right. Any kind of business feedback is useful information. Does this product work? Does it not? So we can think of Amazon's um, text reviews as feedback, and we can use their star system as our, our way to train. Okay. And so people like to give their opinions. This is easy data to get. <clears throat> okay. So we could treat this as a continuous problem, and if the world were better, I would say this is a good idea because I, I'm a statistician at heart and I think that treating data as continuous is uh, more realistic because you know there are some things that I really hate in the world. There are some things that I feel sort of ambivalent about and there are some things I really like. Okay. And wouldn't it be better if instead of forcing myself to put those into buckets or bins or classifications, I could instead treat this as a continuous number. The nice thing about con continuous scales, too, is they allow us more flexibility on where our cutoff score is going to be, and we'll see that <clears throat> here in a little bit, okay. um, where we could scale the data based on that continuous score, so create these cutoff points. Right? <coughs> so we could say that um, a negative review is a polarity score, and this is specifically from text blob, and we'll use this in a little bit. Um, or polarity is less than zero. Okay. Neutral could be polarity right on zero. And positive could be polarity above zero. Okay. Now, specifically, a scale might range from like negative three to three. Okay. Why is neutral only one number? So what about 0 0.1? Okay. 
So we have to think about these cutoff scores kind of critically, because if we're taking a continuous scale that people truly kind of like normally distribute on or you know even uniformly distribute on um, any cutoff that we apply to that automatically forces two reviews or texts um, that are on one on each side of the line into different groups even though they have probably more in common with each other than they do their their scheme so we just have to be careful when we apply these cutoff scores. But, you know, it's nice to have labels instead of numbers because labels are a little easier. And we could um, also, we're not really limited to positive and negative. That's a popular version of this task, but there are lots of different emotions that we could use, like angry, happy, okay, irate. Um, and we could uh, use that at different levels of granularity. Okay, so just like we talked about at the beginning of the semester with part of speech tagging, where we had um, the universal tag set, which has 10 tags, and then we had things like the pin tree bank tag set that has like 50 tags. So the nice thing about using pin is that I can go, I always go down and decrease the number of tags into the universal set, but if I start with the universal set, I can't go anywhere else. All right. So we're going to talk about two types of techniques in this lecture. We're going to look at the unsupervised lexicon-based models first, and then we'll look at more traditional machine learning supervised models second. And then we'll very briefly say there are deep learning models, and here are some tutorials that you can look at, um, mostly because uh, I, I briefly covered deep learning in my other class, but there just aren't good systems for for running those in the cloud. Although someone emailed me last couple days about a system that we might be able to use. But anyways, that's besides the point. Uh, the point being that most people's computers won't run these very well. And the university hasn't agreed to support this kind of computing just yet. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at an example. So we're going to work with that very famous IMDB data set and um, look and see if we can predict the sentiment of those reviews. And in this example, I have the answer. Okay, I have them um, marked as either positive or negative. But what I first want to show you is a system that allows me to add a polarity. Ooh, spit everywhere, sorry. I have a system that allows me to add these polarity scores even if I didn't have the answer. Okay. So because I have the answer, I can do an unsupervised system or a supervised system, okay. and um, I can check to see how good I'm doing. And that's what the benefit of the answer. But I really want to show you these unsupervised systems for data sets where you don't have the answer. Okay. So um, I think a lot of things get lost like, oh, well, we have the coding label, so we have to do a supervised system. We don't. It's probably going to work better. Okay, so as we'll see here, um, in writing our own, comparing these two systems, we'll do better when we train our own model. So that data set has 50,000 reviews, but I have made it smaller, so this will run. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and we always have to think about the technique and its data cleaning system, right? So we've talked a lot about data cleaning all semester, and every task requires a slightly different use of, of that data cleaning. Okay. So in our example, um, we probably won't spell check because there will be a lot of unique names, right? So uh, actors' names, that kind of stuff. And then we probably will um, Brain fart is what we'll do. <laughs> uh, uh, we won't take out punctuation right? because punctuation will be important for some of these systems. And then there's also the consideration of um, stop words. Right? So we'll kind of talk about when should I include and when should I exclude things. All right, so we're going to load up our stuff here in R. We're going to load up our libraries. None of these are new. These are all things that we've used multiple times this semester. Let's load up the data. So the data is um, included in the zip file online, but also I um, 
uh, have it loading here, right, and it's read CSV. The cool thing about Python is it has a native um, zip compression reader when you have big data sets. If you're going to do this in R, uh, actually read underscore the tidyverse version will read zip files, but so will this really cool package called Rio. If you're looking for a great R package that um, does it all when it comes to importing files, Rio is amazing. I think it calls itself the like uh, army knife system or Swiss knife system of importing files. I don't know. It's really great. So FYI. All right. So here's what our reviews look like. Um, We've got the review in column one and the sentiment in column two. I can tell there's a little bit of HTML here in the review that I might have to cut out. Now, I'm going to write myself a little function that combines everything that we've talked about this semester. And the um, this particular function doesn't do any kind of spelling. Phone um, is going off, so I was making sure it wasn't going to come up here on my computer. Uh, this function doesn't do spelling because movie names, abbreviations, slang, all of that um, would get flagged, and we don't. We want those words to stay as they are. Um, so you would expect lots of slang. Sorry. And if you wanted a good sort of middle of the road solution is to find the frequency, the most common mistakes, and fix those only. And so uh, this is a system I have used before where we had 15,000 spelling errors according to our spell checker, and we just looked at the, the frequency of them and fixed the top 100 because there were so many um, singletons, that singletons, individual instances of misspelled words that um, it became tedious to check them all. All right, so we loaded up stop words, and then this is super important here, pay attention. Okay. We are going to take out stop words, <clears throat> but we're going to leave in a few of those stop words. Okay, no, but, and not, because those have clear polarity or sentiment markers. Now, one problem with all of these systems that we're talking about is that they ignore context. So even um, the bag, all that bag of words stuff we did last week, um, that ignores context. Now, word to vec does not ignore context, right? But these, most of the, um, most of these unsupervised systems do. <clears throat> all right, clean up the HTML lowercase all the words. This should look really familiar. Uh, fix all of our contractions. This is super useful because that then gives us the no's and nots, like cannot, do not, that kind of thing. Um, then normalize our text, our UTF-8. And um, for many of these data sets, they're already kind of cleared up. But I was actually, uh, the, the project, the extra credit is over. <laughs> it's got uh, we've had so many issues with this, so encoding is super important to pay attention to, especially if you're not going to use English. Okay. Most of the examples this semester have been in English. That's unfortunate, but um, if you're going to do this in any Cyrillic-based language or things like Chinese, uh, really pay attention to the encoding, okay. because otherwise it will eat those symbols. So I was downloading a data set we were working with that's in Macedonian. If you haven't seen it, it's a cool looking language um, since I can't read it. And uh, m many, many of my like import export kinds of functions uh, ate all the words, which is no good. So be sure you pay attention to the kind of encoding that you're doing. Uh, here's our stop word removal. Okay. And then here is our stimmer. Okay. So I turned off the stimming in this example because we don't want to, um, this, this unsupervised tasks are going to look for specific words, whole words, and so we don't want to stem them because then it will ignore the words that we're looking for. We could consider um, limitizing, going back to the root word, but in general, the, the systems, the unsupervised systems are written in such a way 
Uh, I'm answering your question now. <laughs> the unsupervised systems are written in such a way that they capture um, most of the different forms. So um, ugly, ugliness, like that kind of stuff. They, they're regular expressions. You could limitize them. Um, you kind of beat me to it. Uh, Python's limitized systems are, like ours are better. Um, but in general, the different forms of the words it's looking for, like beauty, beautiful, beautifulness, it's going to grab all of those. Um, but if we stemmed, the way that it changes that word into the stemmed word would mean that it would get ignored. Okay? So it changes beauty and beautifulness to like beauty spelled with an I, which our unsupervised systems would not catch that I'm aware of. So yes, you could limitize them, but most of these systems work great without that. Great is a loose term here. They work okay. <clears throat> Good question. Next. Slides. Give me slides. All right. Now that we've built this function, we can use the fact that pandas has an apply family, much like R has an apply family, and just apply it to the column. Okay. So we have now used this kind of cleanup system one row, one thing at a time. We've done it um, using these kind of applies and some loops, and now we've got it built into one function. So um, if nothing else you've learned this semester, how to clean data is hopefully one of the ones you've really got well, because that is something we spend so much time doing um, and is very important because garbage in, garbage out. All right, so let's look at this now. Now it looks pretty good. Our, our HTML is clearly gone, and I could load up a couple of them. So when I do this, I like pick a couple of really long text ones because it'll have a bunch of different things going on in it and I look at them okay and I'll clean it and I'll look at it again. Okay. Right. Cleaned up. Next. Okay. <clears throat> so let me talk to you a little bit about what these unsupervised models are. Okay. And they're still algorithms that someone has written um, but they're written in a way that you aren't training them. You're just applying this function to it. And that's useful when you don't have labels. You can't write your own algorithm. Okay? You can't tune it. You can't change it yourself. You just kind of have to use it. So, um, for example, cluster analysis is a good unsupervised method. Topics analysis is one as well. And we'll use topics at the end of this lecture to look at kind of what our systems are doing. And then we'll talk about the perils of leaving in punctuation in supervised models. All right, I am back, question mark, are you guys back? <laughs> I think I lost you there for a second. Okay, good, I don't know what happened. I'm just like completely dropped. I often don't notice, <laughs> so I'm glad I did today, otherwise I would've been talking to the wall, okay. Um, nope, it was me. So, our internet's been kind of crappy today, so here we go. <clears throat> All right, so I was saying, and let's just make sure I'm back up to the right spot here, that the unsupervised algorithms are either a good mathematical property, like topics is using a bag of words model, or they have a good, um, they're a tuned for that type of data. Okay. So we're going to look at models that are tuned for sentiment analysis. And then we'll also kind of briefly cover topics at the end. All right. So <clears throat> a lexicon is a dictionary of known vocabulary words okay, with a specific sentiment. 
and these exist multifold. Okay? There are many, many unbelievable numbers of data sets that classify words, especially in multiple languages, um, into positive, negative, and neutral. And they're usually actually given a continuous score, which is, like I said, also a useful thing. Um, so one of the most popular ones that I'm aware of in my own research is called ANU. It's not in any of these data sets, which is a little surprising to me, but um, ANU uh, valence data set. So if you're looking for sentiment data sets, often use the word valence. Um, because that's what science nerd people use instead of sentiment. Okay. So um, this was put together by Bradley and Lang in the 90s, and this is the English version. Okay, there's, <laughs> if you want to see how low tech this is, the words are at the end with their means and standard deviations. There are data set formats of this that are pre-programmed. I'm sure you can find it in R, actually. Um, but this research was really seminal to a lot of other people building their own data sets and the ANU has been translated into I don't even know how many languages at this point. Um, so I know there's SPANU and so it cracks me up because it's like effective norms for English. The E here is English but people still use um, the ANU abbreviation because it is so um, searchable and popular. So here's another one that you can um, use. But what happens is all the all the words have a score. Okay. So ignorance here has a low valence score, which means it's a negative word. Okay. They also tend to have data sets that have these arousal scores. Okay. And arousal is just like how much it brings up a feeling in you, like how much it like you know makes you worked up, so to speak. And the dominance, and I have never totally understood dominance, TBH, um, but uh, it is popular to include. So do they have the little mannequin in here? Maybe he's at the end. So the way that people rate these is they have these like, um, they call it a self-assessment mannequin. Yeah, check it out. This is so fun. Um, so the self-assessment mannequin is this little like character that you use to rate the word. So people didn't rate them with a number, but they rated them with these little like mannequin things. So this is very happy to very sad. And this is arousal. So it makes me like very something like butterfly stomach versus uh, it doesn't do anything to me. And the dominance... <laughs> It just cracks me up. Look at how silly this is. The dominance is it makes me feel very small to very large. Okay. Uh, and so this is kind of how people rate these words. <clears throat> and so if I know what sentiment words are, I can leverage that fact to create a polarity score. And these lexicons are often tied to part of speech, modality, um, mood, sometimes is a word people use, strength. There, there's lots of terminology for this. So some popular lexicon is the Bing lexicon. Okay, so it's just called Bing for the first person of uh, Bingu's name. Um, it contains 6,800 words that are divided into sort of its positive or its negative. Okay, the MPQA subjectivity lexicon is the multi-perspective question answering lexicon. And it's built from opinion corpora, subjectivity ratings. And subjectivity ratings are things are either um, decidedly objective, um, meaning hate is a really easy word to classify as a negative polarity, to things that are more subjective. Okay. Um, I'm, so I don't know if I have a good subjective negative word. Dislike. I don't know. Um, but subjectivity is sort of a rating of like how much the person feels that everyone should agree it's objective versus more, it's more personal experience. Um, opinion finders and more in this data set. Okay, so the word zest is a subjective word. So people feel like that's more based on your personal experience. 
and um, it's generally rated as positive because of this like zest for life phrase that people will use. There's a pattern lexicon and it was developed with WordNet to add polarity, right, subjectivity, intensity, intensity is kind of like um, arousal, and then a confidence rating uh, to words. And this is the one that text blob uses. And so we're going to look at text blob here in a minute. Oh, actually, right now. <laughs> so um, let's take this data set and treat this as like a mixed problem. Okay? I have the answer. So I have my yeses and my noes, or my positives and negatives. And because I have that, I can tell how well my application of this algorithm works. If you don't have the answer, you just have to trust that this works okay. So I'm going to split the data set into testing and training. So train reviews, test reviews, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> Using train test split here that we've used before, we'll put in our reviews, our sentiments, and we split this 80-20. Um, I had a thought, but I've lost it. So um, you don't actually do any training for lexicon-based models, right? Because they simply look up, they look for the word in your text, and then they look um, at the polarity score, and then they do some underlying math to create the final answer. Okay? So there's no tuning here. We're not training. But we're going to split this data set up to kind of see, like, I'm going to take this test data set and see how well the model works okay. because I have the answer okay. and we're going to just use this example throughout to show kind of the accuracy levels of these different things. Okay. Uh, so first thing I'm going to do is just print out a couple of them. I, I think it's helpful to see what's in the data. Okay. So first thing, we're just going to pick some random IDs here. Um, to print out and then for each review and sentiment we kind of are going to look at the three or four IDs we're going to print out the review print out the labeled sentiment and then look at the polarity so here's the function that actually calculates um, the polarity score based on this pattern data. Okay. So it's text blob dot text blob dot sentiment dot polarity because text blob has a lot of underlying functions. Okay. We've already used it for uh, spell checking. And then this thing here just prints the lines. All right, so review, great director. Ironically, most mostly fine films, total waste of time to watch. Admire Hitchcock, purely visual, blah, 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 blah. So this overall seems like a positive review, um, but it has very many negative words in it. Okay, and it's been tagged as a negative review. But the dog was about to bark on my foot. Okay. And if you read the whole thing, it, it turns out to be a pretty negative review. Okay. The polarity score from <clears throat> text blob is hovering right at zero. Okay. And so it maybe leans slightly positive. This next one, funny film, usually usual density components, blah blah blah. This one's been rated as positive. Okay. And it's been predicted as slightly positive. Okay. Um, this one's been rated as positive as well. Uh, far cry from Lonesome Dove. This is about characters play strong, blah, 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 unfair criticism. So see how there's a lot of negative words, even though the final judgment is positive. Because we as people are, um, you know, if we're writing these long reviews, we might make these comparison points. And so we might still use a lot of negative words. I don't understand the criticism. Right. Is the polarity score based on a model that leverages... Yes, great question. So um, the polarity score here 
is a, I don't know the exact math, but my assumption is that it takes the words that are considered positive and the words that are considered negative and essentially subtracts them. Okay. So if I have 10 positive words and 5 negative words, I would end up with a 5. But the scores tend to be pretty close to 0. Um, let's see what it says, actually, instead of just waxing poetic here. Thank you, Stack Overflow, right? <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, 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 that is incorrect. Yeah. This is how somebody used it. Okay, this is not the answer. Let's see if maybe this one has it. Ah, this is the answer. So I'm going to paste this here in our text thing for you guys. Um, so essentially what happens is in text blob, um, the, they have an underlying dictionary. So for the polarity scores, it appears to range from negative one to positive one. Okay. It will have words that are um, rated for their polarity okay, based on their part of speech. And when um, <laughs> this is what I thought it did. Uh, when calculating sentiment, text blob uses a sophisticated te technique known as averaging. <laughs> so it takes all of the words that have a score and just averages them together. Does that answer your question? All of them do something like this. So they grab the list of words and they apply some sort of math to them. Um, but, you know, this walks you through it mathematically. Okay. Now, the real trick is here, their words are included multiple times. Okay. Um, so, uh, essentially, you can have different polarity ratings for the different uses of the word. Okay. Uh, do they take into account negating words? Nope. Great question. Um, all of these models suffer from a loss of context. And so I think this is kind of where I was going a, a second ago. If we look at these reviews, um, there are, uh, like here, ironically, mostly find films a total waste of time to watch, basically is what they're saying. Like, that uh, waste, waste is a, is a pretty negative word here in this uh, situation, but then we've also got great here. So it's going to lose any sarcasm or um, negators like you've just said. So if I say not beautiful, I'll get a score for the not part and a score for the beautiful part. And more than likely, they're going to cancel each other out. Um, so that is a, a large limitation of these types of models. And the only real way to account for context is to move to a word, kind of like a word to vec type model. Easily. Move, move easily. you type in there, but I'm going to move on to the next slide. <coughs> okay, so can we use dependency parsing concept here, not dependent on beautiful attached? Oh, that's a great example. Yeah, good question. <sighs> hmm. I wonder if that much complexity is worth it. Hmm. You could. So what you're suggesting is grabbing those dependencies and you could almost make like cluster phrases, right? So you would grab any, because a lot of these words are, are adjectives, right? Many of the, the um, brain fart, many of the words in these lexicons are adjectives because that's what we, how we describe sentiment, right? Um, so essentially you would say grab maybe the, the adjective clusters, because beautiful is clearly an adjective, and it's maybe going to have a, a dependency, con 
Well, the not in this case is also still an adjective, I think. Don't quote me on that. Might be an adverb. Weird. Um, yeah, so I would think if you did that, you would have to have some sort of underlying um, piece in the, the lexicon that knew to grab the phrase. So you could actually do this a little simpler than the dependency parsing. So generally the way these work is they grab a single token at a time. Okay, so they look for the tokens that they have saved. So here's an example. Instead, you could probably use some form of regular expression where you have like um, not adjective, right? And treat that a specific way. So you would take the adjectives rating and the not rating and then like combine them together is the way I think you could make that work. <clears throat> You can also do the dependencies to find those little phrases. But regular expression might be a little easier. I don't know. Could go either way. But that would be a more context um, sensitive system. Yep. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. All right. So, great questions. Let's look at what TextBlob does right before we <laughs> fix it. <laughs> Let's see. So <clears throat> I'm going to calculate this based on um, the first thousand data points because it's kind of slow because it reads each review and some of these are not short and then calculates that score. So it pattern matches um, it's called the pattern data set because it's pattern matching to those specific word units. Um, so that can be a little slow depending on how big the text files are. And then we have the option to convert those into categorical labels just to measure our accuracy. Those other things I could do here, I could run it in ANOVA to think, or a t-test to see if the positive scores are more positive than the negative scores. I would hope so. Um, there's lots of ways to check this, but the simplest thing to do is to say, well, I'm going to put my cutoff score here and just see how good I did. Um, I feel personally that a continuous approach is more informative, but um, we could simply look at these class labels for accuracy as well. Uh, all right, so this is just me making the data set smaller for class purposes, but here's our little loop that we can do. So text blob, text blob, sentiment polarity for every review in our review data set. And then here's a point of, that we can decide what to do. So now I have these continuous scores. <clears throat> How do I want to break those into those categories? And so I can say, well, the, what's going to classify this as positive if the score is greater than 0.1? Else negative. Why 0.1? Meh, the book did it. But I could pick zero here because we know that these scores range from one to one, okay, negative one to one. And I could figure, I could say, well, zero is the middle, so we'll split on the middle. But I could also do a more sens sensitive analysis by finding the exact point. So this is where receiver operator curves are really handy. Uh, I did not do that here because there's already enough slides, but what we could do is take an ROC analysis and look for that point where the uh, split of the data best creates the highest accuracy. Right? And that's what a lot of people do. So, um, for example, we have this paper <clears throat> that we were trying, to, we had a continuous score that we were trying to use to help diagnose different groups of Alzheimer's and dementia, and um, we found the points that were the most sensitive. And that's a ROC analysis. So this is a number I can manipulate to see how well it works. So let's see how well it works. And um, this particular model performance metrics is in the um, extra PY file, but that class, um, that one in scikit-learn that's like a classification report is also pretty good. So, you know, either one. Um, and this one's giving me a future warning error that I gotta figure out and fix. But until then, we put in the uh, real labels, we put in the 
predicted labels, and we just see what happens. So the model gets about 75% right, which I would argue in a sentiment system is not very good. Okay, 50 50 is chance, but sentiment models tend to be um, a well known problem space, and we tend to do a little better than this. But this may be pretty good if you don't have any labels and you can't train your own system. Okay. Bless you. Um, the precision and recall for each group is approximately equal, so we're not doing one better than the other, which is good. And we can see in our confusion matrix down here that it's like roughly equal, like we're not, um, there's not a bias towards one or another. So 75%, hold on to that number. Let's look at another one. The AFIN lexicon, which I don't even know if I remember what AFIN stands for, is very popular. I've used it in my own work um, because it's pretty, also pretty simple. <clears throat> and the advantage to AFIN over text blob is um, that, that AFIN also considers emotions or um, emoticons. So I didn't, sorry, dog is being ridiculous right now. I didn't um, exclude any punctuation, which will cause us problems later, but um, punctuation is actually an interesting marker of emotion, mostly only exclamation points. But if you had to guess, which side is it, right? So is an exclamation point a good marker for excitement or is it a good marker for like how much you hate something? And I think that's one potential reason to not use um, exclamation points is because I don't know that I think that it actually is distinguishing. Right? Maybe the number of exclamation points, right? But uh, all by themselves, who knows? But this lexicon does actually handle uh, simple emoticons like um, a colon, um, parentheses. It, I don't think, I'm not sure if it converts the emojis themselves, so a picture into Unicode, but that would be a good system too. Words are scored from five to negative five, negative five to five, and instead of um, averaging, this is summed. Okay, so the scores are going to be larger, and you do have to install the AFIN library first. Alright, All right, so what we're going to do here, <laughs> one second. The entirety of my household is in within like three feet of me, and the cat was screaming, but he's just screaming to scream because he's a cat. And if you have cats, I think hopefully you know this, but sometimes they just yell for fun. All right, um, where are we at? Let's talk about AFIN now. Okay, that's a distraction Thursday. Um, I'm importing the AFIN library, and I load uh, the AFIN model. So you can turn emoticons off or on, but to me it seems advantageous to turn them on. So you really don't want to exclude punctuation if you're going to use this. This is the same code, so let's just now use AFIN, and here is how AFIN works. It's very easy, dot score, <clears throat> and let's look. Okay, same reviews, and we get a different pattern. Okay, this one's still the lowest. Um, but it clearly has more words that has found as positive than negative. This one's found as the next medium, the next one up, so to speak. And in contrast to our text blob work, this one is now the most positive. So for text blob, the pattern was basically 0, um, 0.4, and like 0.2. So they are clearly doing different things. <clears throat> let's, you know, um, figure out how well we could classify with AFIN now. 
Now we have a bigger problem because text blob is averaged okay, and runs from negative one to one. And so there's a, there's a bounded range on what the score can be. Right? So it, it's gonna be from negative one to one and it's gonna be, you know, we can, we can think about our cutoff score somewhere in the middle there. The scores for this type of data, since they run from negative five to five, technically have a bounds of infinity. If we had um, enough, all, you know, the bounds are as many negative words as there are in the data set added up okay. uh, or positive. And so like, is zero now a good representation of neutral, like the middle to split on? Or, should we be using, um, we know that these are kind of wishy-washy on the context, as you, a couple of you have noted, and maybe, maybe like 10 is a good cutoff score because it tends to overestimate polarity, okay, positive polarity. Okay. Um, so we could move this number around, and again, this is really where an RFC analysis would be helpful. Um, <clears throat> so I could, uh, uh, calculate all the scores right? and then do the same if else kind of clause and I picked one here and I, I encourage you to like play with this in the notes and change the score to a different number and see if you can do better and how are we doing well about 70 percent so while AFIN can grab these punctuation pieces and turn and emoticons and turn them into text, maybe they should have been averaged instead of summed. Okay. Um, because a sum, the problem with a sum is that it, um, you know, if you use a word multiple times, it, it, it increases the score multiple times. Uh, the great thing about average is we kind of are eliminating the fact that some of these have more words that are found than others. But maybe those more words were important. It's an empirical question. Now, here what we see is that this particular data set is actually much better at positive than it is negative. I can see that in our, um, our scores here, but really down here. Okay, we're predicting pretty much everything is positive. <laughs> All right, so the negative ones are what we're missing. <clears throat> so, so far, text blob is a little better. Another, um, we'll do two more, Cinti WordNet and Vader, I think are the other, just the last two. Yeah. And then we'll switch. Okay. So Cinti WordNet is based on um, WordNet, clearly, <laughs> and it's based on those sin sets from WordNet. So now we're grabbing the, con the, the like synonyms of those words too. So if most of the synonyms are negative, this, this grouping or for that word will also be negative. And so each sin set is coded as either positive, negative, or a object. It's coded both ways, sorry. Um, with a kind of a positive word score, a negative word score, this is just one minus positive, and an objectivity score okay, to get at um, kind of the influence of personal opinion on these ratings. And uh, a sin set, remember, is just a, a list of similar words and um, that are all kind of grouped together. So for example, <clears throat> we're going to import Scentsy WordNet as uh, SWN. You might have to download it. So here's the code to download it if you don't have it yet. And let's look at awesome here. So we're picking awesome as an adjective and grabbing its um, polar positive score. So uh, just the first one, so it's 0 0.875, 0 .8, and the negative score is, like I said, one minus, so 1.25, and its objectivity score is zero, okay, which means it's subjective. Because okay. when things are awesome, that seemed that has been rated as a subjective uh, feeling. All right. How do we apply this, though? Because I now have the scores, and I can make up my own algorithm. 
So it doesn't have the sort of pre-built summing or, or averaging functions in it. So we, this is where we can get really creative. I'm not that creative, but we could, you could think of ways to creatively score these things. Okay. Um, however, this is like even slower than um, text blob because remember that WordNet requires a part of speech. Um, so first thing we got to do is find all the part of speeches to grab what the appropriate sense set, if it exists, grab the Cinti WordNet score, if it exists, then I am doing this really fancy algorithm called subtraction. Okay. So we're just going to subtract the positive minus the negative. We could just take the positive scores. We could just take the negative scores. We could sum them, we could average them, we could, you know, there's lots of things you can do here, but I'm going to go non-creative and do fancy math called subtraction, and then I'm going to print that out. Um, all right, so to do the part of speech stuff, we talked all year about how good Spacey is, so I'm going to use Spacey. And then this is just us making a function. So what are we doing? First thing you do, what are all of the this function will grab the token and the part of speech tag. So we're going to look at one word at a time, and it's part of speech. We're going to set all of our preset scores to zero. So we're going to start with this reviews everything. It's just a zero score. Then for each word and its tag, we're going to loop. So it has a double loop. That's why it's kind of slow. Um, we're going to say, well, if the part of speech is a noun, grab the Cinti WordNet scores for that noun and the first one from the list. And this just assumes that the first one is the right definition, uh, but the first one's the most probable, so it's the best guess we got. If it's a verb, grab the verbs. If it's an adjective, Grab the adjective. So right here, we're just sort of mapping the part of speech tag to the, the appropriate um, Cinti word tag. If it's an adverb, grab the adverb and grab that Cinset. If the Cinset is found, because for some words, they won't have one, okay, then add the positive score to our positive list, the negative score to the negative list, the objective score to the objective list, and keep a count of the total number of synsets that we've used. Then let's aggregate our final scores. So final positive minus negative. You could get really creative here. We could also normalize that score. So I was just talking about the difference between AFIN and text blob is that um, text blob averages, which sort of deals with the fact that reviews have different numbers of, of found words in them, whereas um, AFIN uh, totals the scores. So uh, that can influence the distribution of scores. So we could normalize it by, by averaging and rounding. And then this is where the magic is happening. So we're just kind of doing this all at once. If the um, if the normalized score is greater than zero, it's positive, else it's negative. And then this is just some fancy stuff from the book that allows you to print out all of those in a like nice pandas data frame. Okay. And so it'll show you the entire um, data frame. So the positive score, the negative score, the overall score, like everything. All right. So let's take that function and apply it. So we just print it out here. And let's see. So for our Hitchcock review, <clears throat> the predicted sentiment is negative. So that matches. Its objectivity is kind of high. Positive score is pretty low. The negative score is also pretty low. But overall, that gives me this, um, this uh, overall negative score, which means that it, get cl it got classified as a negative one. The second one is positive, um, still pretty objective. The positive score is higher than the negative score, so this got positive rating. And then the last one is also positive because it came up with approximately the same score. 
Now, this looks cool, and it looks good because it's the only one that's captured the fact that this one says it's negative. Sorry, I got excited. However, if we run this on all of them, and this is quite slow because it's looking up the sentiment word net score for every word. So that's just what makes it kind of slow. Uh, it's not actually as good as AFIN. So with our current fancy algorithm of subtraction, we are only hitting about 69%. Now, this is where I think you could really do some cool stuff. So you could um, change the algorithm from, like, let's find, okay, well, we normalize the scores, but let's say 0.1 is positive, or, you know, um, um, let's use the raw scores and just look at that. So we can play with um, the underlying algorithm because we wrote it ourselves. Okay? So there's a lot of things I could do here to change the predictiveness of this type of model. So the thing I like about the Cinti WordNet is it allows us to capture the, the part of speech, which is clearly going to be pretty important for um, the interpretation, but it also suffers from being a fairly slow algorithm because of the amount of work that goes into it, whereas TextBlob, without us doing a whole lot to it, was already 75%. So pros and cons here. Which ones is it getting more right than wrong? Well, it's mostly missing the negative ones. Hey, don't you stop. All right, one more lexicon tonight, Vader. Vader is such a cool lexicon. I mean, like, what they, how long did they sit and make up that name, right? So it stands for the Valence Aware Dictionary and Sentiment Reasoner. Okay. They um, kind of threw in the E. <laughs> To make it cool, because the last it should be they sir, I guess. Um, it includes slang, which none of the rest of them do, and emoticons. And everything is coded from four to negative four. Don't eat my thing. Don't eat my thing. Stop. So you guys should see this bad dog because it's almost the end of the semester and he's being very distracting. So let's give the bad dog a walk. Can you guys still hear me? Hey. Somebody? Anybody? Yeah. Great. Okay. Check out this, this bad dog. He's eating my floor stand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that's who I'm yelling at right now. <laughs> His name is Buck, and he's being, he's trying to eat my, um, I have a, uh, one of those compression mats so that when I teach class, my uh, feet don't hurt. <clears throat> and he's trying to eat it right now. Don't eat my mat. All right. So that's who I've been, um, yelling at. And because I know you guys like dogs. Vader is coded from four to four though, to get back on topic. Um, <clears throat> And these were coded by raters. Uh, a lot of the dictionaries are coded by raters, so that's actually not super special. Uh, but things like Bing, the Bing data set is just, I think, him doing it. So, um, uh, AFEN, I know AFEN is coded by raters. I don't know what the um, text blob does, so I'm sure they have it explained somewhere. So we're going to take a similar approach to um, to uh, Vader as we just did for Cincy WordNet. Okay. And so it has this function called Sentiment Intensity Analyzer. Now you might have to download the Vader lexicon. These are in, in LTK. And we're basically rewriting that whole function, but we're including the threshold. This makes it a little easier for you to play with where the cutoff score should be. And what we do is we load the analyzer and we tell it to give us the polarity score. Um, but the nice thing about uh, doing it this way is there's these like aggregate scores. Um, there's, there's more built into polarity than you might expect 
So you could pull the, the there's like a raw score and an aggregate score, and we've just grabbed what's called the compound score. So there's more in there that we could pull out. And then we just said, well, if the aggregate score is greater than the threshold, I think this little slash is a sorry, is a typo. Um, or it's a it's a code like, hey, this is gonna go on to the next line, but basically if uh, the aggregate score is greater than the threshold, it's positive, else it's negative. And then um, what it does down here is it prints out these uh, the different scores that are possi possible. So we grabbed the compound one, but there's also one that's just a positive score, one that's negative, and one that's neutral. And so this shows you all of the possible data that's available in Vader. So the same three ones. And here I increase the threshold to 0.4, just for fun, to see what would happen. And when I did that, it made this one positive. Okay. It said that it's 26% positive, 11% negative, and 63% neutral. So this is kind of classifying uh, the proportion of the words that go into these different bins. Okay. And this is very similar to the way the, uh, the Luke works, the linguistic inquiry and word count kind of thing works, where it kind of kind of parcels up, like these are the words that are positive, these are the words that are negative, etc. And it does give us this polarity score, although I don't know that I've seen a whole lot of variation in that score. You could subtract. Um, well, it's more positive than negative, that kind of thing. Um, but it would give us the same answer for all of this, that all of them are fairly positive. And so how well does this do? Well, it hovers in the area of a pen. And this thankfully is not super long to run. It's Cinti word that really takes forever to run. Uh, so we end up about 70%. So text blob was the best. Okay, without doing too many, um, without like really investigating or tuning our cutoff score, text blob is the best. Followed by AFEN and Vader, and then Cinti WordNet is, I hate to use the word worse since it was 68%, but it's the lowest of our, of our ones we've looked at so far. Okay. Now, I will note here that, that the negative ones are still the ones it's missing, and that's useful information. So what I would do next, if I was trying to fix my score, is print out the negative um, reviews and look at their range of scores. Like, is it just that we need to increase our threshold? Or is there something different that, that we can do to really separate them? Or is this algorithm just not worth our time? Okay. Uh, and so trying to figure out like, if the threshold is something we can change, or do we want to do some subtraction? Or like, how can we modify our algorithm to improve our results? So all of those together are um, uh, unsupervised lexicon approaches, okay, where it, their, their usefulness is if you don't have a trained model um, that you and don't have the, the, the answers to train your own model. Okay, so if you don't have either one of those, those types of lexicons will work pretty well for you. Um, there's also still obviously cluster analysis or a topics approach. There are other unsupervised tasks that would work here. Um, but text blob is fairly popular. And there are lots of um, articles on ways to improve text blobs, kind of visual, their results. Like, how do I make this a better algorithm? And, and you can um, grab the underlying text blob numbers yourself. And I think this kind of covers some of how that works to tweak it if you think that's the easiest approach for you. All right, let's see where we're at. Let's think about, all right, so we've got this slide, feature extraction, yeah, yeah. Let's just stop there. Um, uh, let me do this slide and then we'll, we'll break here and save the rest of this for Saturday. Okay, so surely we can do better than 70%. Okay. And um, these models, the previous models are really great when you have a new task or you want a quick answer or your boss is like, hey, it's 
Wednesday. I'm going to give you this task where tell me how positive people think about us and it's due Friday. <laughs> so those will be quick approaches that you can use. Um, if you have the time and an appropriate training data set, you could train your own model to make a better classifier. And there are plenty of data sets I think that lend themselves to this, so this IMDB data set, but let's say you're trying to look at uh, product reviews. There's an Amazon product review data set that will work really well. So the there are things out there that I think would allow you to build your own model. Um, you just want to would want to match the training data to what you expect your data to look like. Okay. But reviews are reviews sometimes. Like this is a well-known problem. Okay. All right. So.